Hey, happy Easter. I am so thankful that you are joining us online here via CanyonRidgeBaptist.tv, on YouTube or Facebook or on our website, however it is that you're viewing us today. We are so thankful that you are here, and I pray that the music, the corporate time of worship was a blessing and an encouragement to you, uh, though nothing is like meeting together and the gathering of the saints and encouraging one another. I think this is a great alternative uh, because of the condition of our world that we're praying will end very soon. But in the interim, we are super pumped that you are here. Would you do me a favor this morning? Would you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in your Bible. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Corinthians, of 1 Corinthians, his first letter that we have recorded to the church at Corinth. He wrote it um, and uh, He's dealing with a lot of issues, and as he comes to the end of the book here, the Apostle Paul begins to deal or deals with uh, the issue of the resurrection. Now, he is writing in 1 Corinthians 15, which is the third longest chapter in all the New Testament. Um, he is writing here dealing with the resurrection, not the resurrection per se of Jesus Christ. He is going to deal with that uh, in part, but he is dealing with really their own resurrection. They were doubting, these people were, the church at Corinth, that when they died, they would go to heaven. Many of them believed that they would just cease to exist. Many of them believed that they would just die and there would be nothing after that, a cessation of existence. That's what they believed. But they had a deeper understanding, one that is intrinsic to all mankind, that this life that we currently live is not an end in itself. It is not the end of it all. They understood accurately, I would add, that there is something more. But there were some in the church who were saying and that were arguing that this is the end of it all. <clears throat> or they were saying this is as good as it gets. When you die, it's over. And this was causing great anxiety in the church. This was causing great problems in the church. Well, why was this causing great problems as we work our way into this passage of Scripture? It was causing great problems because everybody dies. 1997, The Onion, that satirical website, uh, posted an article with this headline, World Death Rate Holds Steady at 100%. <laughs> which is quite comical, they go on in their satirical way of writing this, the World Health Organization officials express disappointment Monday at the group's finding that despite the enormous efforts of doc doctors, rescue workers, and other medical professionals worldwide, the global death rate remains consistent at 100%. Death and a, this is what they call death, death a metabolic affliction causing total shutdown of all life functions has long been considered humanity's number one health concern responsible for 100% of all recorded fatalities worldwide, the condition has no cure. That really is the truth of the matter. Though written by a satirical uh, website and a little bit humorous in some ways, we would all agree with the statement that death has no cure. The quote is attributed to Benjamin Franklin that there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. And the people at the church at Corinth were really, really struggling with this. They were really struggling with this concept that they were going to die, and there's nothing after it. They had heard of a resurrection. They had heard that their bodies would rise. And so the Apostle Paul is writing, and he's going to be a blessing to them, and he's going to help them, and he's going to encourage them. And in so doing, he starts with the doctrine that is essential to the Christian faith. And that is the physical resurrection of the body of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is 100% God. He is the Son of God. God says it in John chapter 3, verse number 16, and throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 9, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's why He was crucified, because He claimed to be the Son of God. They hated this concept, but I will attest to you today on the authority of the Word of God that Jesus Christ is is God. Jesus Christ died and he was buried and three days later he rose from the grave. Well this has huge implications. If that is true and according to the Bible it is, if that is true it changes everything. If it's not true then humanity just goes on in existence but it is is true. And the Apostle Paul is writing here, and he's going to encourage the church at Corinth and their struggle with a physical resurrection, and he encourages them by way of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what Easter is all about, and what brings us great joy on this Easter Sunday, is the fact that we are celebrating the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. I'm fearful in some ways that all of us get a little too Christianized in our thinking. We're like, oh yeah, we believe in the resurrection. We're good. Oh yeah, that's a good thing. And we lose the ideal or the power or the potency of the resurrection of Christ. And Paul, in talking to these folks, Paul is encouraging them this morning, and he is encouraging them this morning, number one, through a gospel connection, through a gospel connection. I want you to notice with me in verse number one of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, in verse number two, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. I want you to notice this morning the gospel connection Paul says in verse number two or verse number one of our text, uh, uh, brethren, I declare unto you, I want to, the word declare just means I want to impress upon you, I want to put it in mind. He's, in other words, he's not just making a, a statement, he's not just talking for the sake of conversation. No, no, no. The Apostle Paul is talking in this text to impress upon the church at Corinth or to put something in their mind or to get them to think about something. It it would be like a parent declaring something to their child, like you must do your homework or you must brush your teeth. Now, not obviously brushing your teeth and doing your homework is not to the same level of the eternal life. We understand that, but that's what the idea of the word declare means. I want to impress this upon you. Paul says, moreover, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, or as it is accurately defined, the plan of salvation. Paul says, I want to declare unto you, the church at Corinth, you're struggling in your faith, you're struggling with some questions, you're struggling should you stay faithful, you're struggling whether or not you should do the things that the Bible commands you to do or teaches you to do, encourages you to do, and helps you to do. I want you, church at Corinth, to remember the way that you are saved. And you are saved by trusting in Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he was buried, and three days later he rose again from the grave under his own power, in his own ability. He was raised by God, and he is God. And Paul says there's a, under this gospel connection in verses 1 and 2, there's a personal connection. He says, which I preached unto you. Paul never separated himself from the gospel. 
A lot of times it seems as though we want to come to church, and, and rightly so, we want to learn how to live a better life. That's a good thing. We want to learn how to be a better husband, and that's a great thing, and be a better wife. That's a wonderful thing. We want to learn how to have good kids, and that's a great thing, and, and how to be good in a lot of different areas. But the power of God unto salvation, the Bible says, is the gospel of Christ, and that is the anchor on which the Christian is to hold the entirety of their walk with Christ. It is the gospel. Paul understood the gospel. He had received the Lord as his Savior, the risen Lord as his Savior. In Acts chapter 9, when he was on the road to Damascus, he had had an encounter with Jesus. He had submitted to God, the God who had Jesus Christ, who had died for his sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And Paul was gloriously saved. And Paul says, I'm preaching the gospel unto you. I'm preaching it to you. And really, Paul is saying, I have received. We'll see this in a minute. I have received this gospel. I preached unto you, Paul goes on to say, which you also received. There's this personal connection, but there's an enthusiastic connection in this text as well, which you also received. The, the phrase which you also received indicates an enthusiastic response. There were times as a kid that my parents would say, hey, Chris, I want you to wash the car. It's good that kids work, and my parents trained me that way, and I had to go wash the car. But I never really enthusiastically said, oh, man, that's awesome, I get to wash the car. I can remember as a kid growing up in a pastor's home, Easter Sunday would come, and boy, my mom and dad would have, we'd have fun, they'd do an egg hunt for us, and Man, we'd, we'd go to church that morning, we'd come home, they would hide the eggs, and, and we'd go hunt and we would find them. And my mom would often say, hey, are you ready? I, I have it. Are you sure you want to do it? Uh, are you sure you want to do the egg hunt? Man, we'd have an enthusiastic response to that. We were excited to be a part of that. She didn't have to ask us twice about it. We were enthusiastic, and that's the idea of this phrase, which you have received. It's an enthusiastic response. Accepting Christ, believing the gospel, wasn't something that was forced on the church at Corinth. They didn't have to be talked uh, into it. Now their questions were answered. The Holy Spirit of God convicted their heart of sin, righteousness, and judgment, the Bible says. But, but when they accepted Christ as their Savior, it was like, yes, I'm going to accept Him. And that's what he's saying, which you have received. I want to say this to you this morning. I want to be very clear uh, to you as a follower of Jesus Christ, that, uh, or even as not, not as a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're on the fence and you don't exactly believe yet. Can I tell you this? No. No one can con you into believing, and no one can, can coerce you into believing. No one can convince you against your will into believing. The gospel has to be received, and can I be super candid with you? It has to be enthusiastically received. Now, that might play out differently for different folks. Not everybody is enthusiastic in the same way. But that is the idea that salvation comes to those who willingly, humbly, submissively call on Christ as their Savior. It's a continual connection, verse number one, verse number one and two, really, wherein you stand. Paul is talking to the church at Corinth. Hey guys, you've received Christ as your Savior. You've repented of your sins, you trusted Christ, and that's where you are standing. You are saved because of the sacrificial death, the burial, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, wherein you stand. And notice verse number two, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Some people say, well, pastor, if you keep in memory, does that mean you could lose your salvation? No, 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 not at all. The word if there is not in the sense that you could lose your salvation, but that you were sincere to begin with. Whoever puts their trust in God, God holds their salvation. 
God is the keeper of their salvation. Some people come to God and they'll pray a prayer, but they're really, in their minds, the keeper of their salvation. They have to attend church enough. They have to do good enough. They have to give enough. They have to do all of these things enough. And then they'll prove to God that they merit salvation. And Paul is saying here, guys, you have got to understand that you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. And what Paul preached unto them was that they are desperately uh, without hope hope apart from the sacrificial death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ that it's not by works of righteousness Paul says but by the mercy of God that he saves us it is not by our own merit but it is by the work it is by the effort of God that he saves us his blood that washes away all of our sin his blood that sets us free his blood is what cleanses us it is his blood that takes the Bible uses this analogy of a of a dirty garment, a dirty shirt, a dirty uh, uh, suit coat, a dirty pair of pants, whatever. It's as though your sins be as scarlet, I'll they be. I will make them white as snow. And the idea is that your clothes are filthy and spotted and dirty and dark, but it is God who comes and miraculously by the sacrificial death, burial and resurrection of Christ and through his blood he washes us and makes us clean and makes us new. If You believed in sincerity. That doesn't mean you have perfect belief. It doesn't mean you have perfect knowledge. But if by faith, if by faith you say, God, I can't do it all and I'm trusting in you and I'm trusting only in your death and only in your burial and only in your resurrection. It's all of you and it is not of me. And so Paul says, if you keep in memory what I preach and he preached the death, burial and resurrection of them, which is what he's talking about here. And then he says, unless you believed in vain, you put faith sort of in Christ, but this is the idea of vain, but it wasn't all the way. You came to the agreement that Christ is a good guy. You you came to the thought that Christ is a good man. But you didn't put true faith and true trust in Christ. And Paul says this, if your faith is not sincere, here's the idea, you will eventually walk away. He says, hey, I've been preaching this. And there's a gospel connection here. There's also in verses 3 and 4, a gospel clarification For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again in the third day according to the Scripture. And then he goes on to give testimony of the resurrection, which we will not deal with today. But he says in verse number 5, he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve, or the apostles. After that, he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. Meaning this, that Christ was seen of Peter, he was seen of the apostles, apostles. He was seen of a group of 500 people at a single time, and the vast majority of those folks are still alive to this day. They're they're first-hand witnesses of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. People sometimes say, I don't believe in the resurrection. Well, there was a lot of people in in Paul's day that that wanted to argue with the resurrection, but there were just too many witnesses, and based on the preponderance of the evidence, there's a 100% guarantee that Jesus Christ bodily rose from the grave. 500 people at a single time saw him. If you're accused of a crime... They come to you and they say, hey, we saw, we, 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 we uh, have testimony or we believe that you broke into the bank in the middle of the night, or, or, or let me rephrase that, you broke into the bank Sunday morning at 11 o'clock and we know that you're the one that did it. And you go, no, 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 I was in church and there were several hundred people there that saw me. And if detectives come to church and they start interviewing person after person after person and they look at one another and they say, there are several hundred witnesses that saw John Doe at church on Sunday morning. Can I tell you that several hundred witnesses prove your innocence? Several hundred witnesses are are proof that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And so Paul goes on and he declares that all the way through verse number 11. 
But in verse number three, the gospel is clarified, and he says there, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. In other words, that which I also received is that same idea that we talked about, that Paul joyfully, it's the same Greek word, that Paul joyfully or enthusiastically received the gospel. That the gospel was not something that Paul came to fighting. He did not come to remorseful. He did not come to in an angry tone. No, no. The apostle Paul uh, laid all the evidence out. He saw Christ on the road to Damascus. And when he met the Lord and was convicted of his sin of righteousness and judgment of his own sin, the righteousness of God and the judgment that would come, the apostle Paul stepped back and stepped back and joyfully received the gospel. So he says here, I I delivered to you, I gave you what I myself received. Well, what did I receive? That Christ died for our sins. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Paul said, I received this. See, the Bible says repeatedly that Christ died for our sins. Matthew chapter 26, verse number 28 For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, God laid on Christ, the iniquity, another word for sin, the iniquity of us all. The death of Christ. Christ died according to the scriptures. Galatians chapter 1. The Bible says, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. He gave himself for our sins. See, folks, you know that you're a sinner. I do too. I've talked to thousands of people in my life about their faith in Christ and very rarely, there have been a few occasions, very rarely does anybody deny the fact that they've done wrong. Very rarely does anyone deny the fact that they've sinned. We've broken God's law. We've broken God's commandments. And Paul says here that Christ died for our sins. Galatians chapter 1, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and of our Father. Galatians 3, verse number 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Hebrews 10, verse number 11 and 12, every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. But this man, Christ, after he had had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. That was with his death. Christ died for your sins. Not only did Christ die for your sins, notice the Verse number four, Christ was buried and that he was buried. We talked about this last week on Sunday night, Sunday, our Sunday evening Bible study. Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 to 60. Mark 15, 43 to 46. Luke 23, 50 to 53. John 19, 38 to 42. All talk about the burial of Jesus Christ. A man named Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body off the cross and, and took his body and, and prepared it for burial. That means he, he bound it up with grave clothes. Clothes. He, he, he bound it up. He anointed his body. He cared for his body. He put his body in a tomb and he rolled a stone over the tomb. He was buried. The idea of the word buried here is the word internment. It was very rocky soil there. They didn't always put people in the ground. But even then, the idea was one to to place in a a holding place, one to place in a grave, one to place in a tomb. Christ was buried. Notice verse number four again. And he was buried, and the third I'm sorry, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Christ was buried, 
and Christ rose again. He rose again. He rose again under his own power. It'd be miraculous if he rose again under somebody else's power. That doesn't happen. But he rose again under his own power. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 6 chronicles this, where it says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became his dead men and the angel answered and said unto the women who had come to minister to the body of Christ these women came to minister to the body of Christ and they were going to anoint his body they thought he was in the tomb and the angel answered and said unto the women fear not ye for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified he is not here for he is risen as he said Come see the place where the Lord lay. Luke chapter 24, verse 5 to 7. The Bible says, And they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth. They said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He, same story, He is not here, but is risen. Remember how He spake unto you when He was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Acts chapter 2, verse number 32 A little over 40 days after Christ ascended into heaven, Peter stands up and he preached, which is in Jerusalem. He preaches in Jerusalem. There were so many people there who were eyewitnesses. They weren't believers, but they were eyewitnesses. And Peter says to them, he's preaching to them Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. And he says to them, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. He tells to the crowd of unbelievers, you are a witness. And the message of the resurrection was so powerful that thousands of people on that day in Jerusalem turned to faith in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the message was so powerful that many of the priests, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees who chanted crucify him, who denied him, who walked away from him, who ignored him, who persecuted him, many of the Roman soldiers who persecuted him, many of them turned to faith in Jesus Christ. Not because of his message per se. They had heard all the things that he had said, but it was the power of the resurrection that changed everything. Christ lived. Did miracles, fulfilled every Old Testament prophecy. That wasn't enough. He was crucified. His blood washed away sin. He was buried. He was put in a tomb. Didn't change the world by and large. Most folks were casual at best. But he was buried and then he rose again from the grave. And that changed everything the resurrection well what does that mean for us does that have any personal implications well look in verse number 55 of our text of of first corinthians 15 and paul is writing here to these people who are questioning and doubting and fearful and paul says to them O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, talking to believers now, be you steadfast, unmovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Here's what Paul says. Oh, death, where's your sting? Everybody is going to die, and everybody, by and large, in the world, most folks in the world, are worried about death. Some people are worried, and they become fearful, and, and, and they try to stay away from everyone and everything, and they, 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 we see this even with the coronavirus. Some people, man, they, 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 they are hibernating. They are, they are totally isolated in their, in their life. They've isolated and walled themselves off from the rest of humanity. And, and, and boy, they're, they're, they're isolated. That's the way they deal with their fear. Other people are, are careless and, and, and callous towards things. And they're like, oh, I don't care. When I die, I die. No one really believes that, but they say that, and it's a means of coping for them. They're like, oh, just when I die, I die. No, no, we, we all have a question about what happens when we cease to exist. And Paul says, death, where is your sting? Death, where is the, the trouble that you bring? Then Paul Paul answers it for the Christian. The, and he goes on to say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As a believer in Jesus, I don't have to fear death. I was talking to one of the men of our church this week, Friday. We were sitting around talking and he shared with us, he said, hey, I've changed my will a little bit. He goes, I put in my will now that if I am, because of the coronavirus, if I'm in the hospital and somebody else is in the hospital and we both need the ventilator, give them the ventilator. We all kind of looked at him and he's like, give them the ventilator. And these were his words. I know what happens to me when I die. I know where I'm going. And I thought, yes. Yes, the sting of death is not there. Why? Because of the risen Savior. Because Christ rose again from the grave. See, the power of death, the potency of death, and the problem of death all died when Christ arose. The power of death the permanence of death and the problem of death all died when Christ arose. Well, what does that mean? That means there's hope for every one of us. You can have eternal life. You can have eternal life, but you can only have eternal life through Jesus Christ. See, the Bible is very clear. All men are sinners. And some of you say, well, Jesus Christ came and he saves everybody. No, no, he doesn't save everybody. He only saves those who repent and trust him as their savior. He will save anybody, but they must come to him in accordance and in obedience to his word. See, we're all sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you're listening to me today, you're no different than I am and I'm no different than you are. We are all sinners. We've all missed the mark of God's goodness. We, none of us can attain to the perfection that God requires. We are all sinners. And there is a price to pay for our sin. We're all sinners, but that comes with a cost. That comes with a price. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse number 23, the wages of sin is death, or what we earn because we are sinners is death. It's an eternal death where we're eternally separated from God. It's a physical death where our body dies and we're put into a grave. It's a painful death in that it's, in, it's a death where we spend eternity in the fires of hell. I don't say that because I'm callous about it. I don't say that because I like it at all. I say that because it's true. And I love you and I don't want you to go there. What you earn, that's the word wage, what you earn, it's like minimum wage, what you earn because you are sin a sinner is death. Eternal separation from God in hell. And there's a price that has to be paid. And that's the price that mankind has to pay for their sin. If they want to pay it themselves. 
but Jesus Christ already paid the price. Romans chapter 6, verse number 23 goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's gift to you is eternal life. So he contrasts here. There's death because of the wages of sin, and there's eternal life. Well, what does eternal life mean? It means eternity with God in heaven. You say, Pastor, how amazing is heaven? Oh, I don't know how amazing it is, but it's amazing. It's beyond the Bible says, beyond our comprehension. The scripture says, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath any thing, uh, neither uh, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Can't even fathom how awesome heaven's going to be. And I'm not talking about like giant Santa Claus in the sky and, you know, sunshine, rainbows, and lollipops kind of stuff. I'm talking about heaven is going to be such an amazing place and an eternal opportunity for us to worship God and eternal fulfillment in our worship of God in heaven. And here's the idea. The gift of God is eternal life how? Through Jesus Christ. What does he mean by Jesus Christ? Through the death, burial, and resurrection. Faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a gift. It can't be earned. You can't work for a gift. There's no way. The second you start to try to work for a gift, it ceases to be a gift and becomes a wage. So you see how Paul is laying out this argument in Romans. The, gift, uh, the wages of sin, what you earn for your sin is death. But there's a gift, and you cannot work for a gift. It is impossible to work for a gift. Don't even think that. It would be foolish of you to think you could work for a gift. It is impossible for a person to work for a gift, as Paul describes it. You cannot work for a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says something similar in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, pastor, that's great. If Jesus already paid the debt, I'm good. No, no, no. But you have to understand this. You have to believe that Jesus is God. That he's the son of God. You have to believe that Jesus died for you. You have to believe that he was buried and that he rose again. Repenting of your sins and trusting only in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that he is the Lord, that Jesus is the Lord, God, creator of the universe. You say, well, I think there's a God out there and I think Jesus might be him. Okay, you're not saved. He is the Lord, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. From your heart, your innermost being, the depths of your soul, you believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. doesn't mean you have all the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. We come in faith, but you believe in your heart, I know God raised Christ from the dead. Thou shalt be saved, the scripture says. It goes on to say in verse number 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So here's the deal. You've got to understand you're a sinner. You've got to understand that Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin. Because a price had to be paid. If you pay it, it's eternity in hell. If Christ pay it, pays it, it's a gift, it's eternal life. Well, how do I accept it? It's believing in your heart. You can't do anything for it, but believe that he is God, that he died for you, that he was buried, and that three days later he rose again, and that he'll give you victory over death, and there'll be no more sting to death. There'll be no more sting to the grave. There'll be no more sting to hell because Jesus gave the final victory in all our life. And you must call on God to save you and enthusiastically respond to the gospel. There's a lot of people who believe everything that I just said, but they've never called on God to save them. I talked to a person one time, they say, Pastor, there's nothing that you said that I don't believe, but I don't want to accept Christ right now. I'll do it at another time. See, Satan doesn't mind if you believe everything about the gospel as long as you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior as long as you don't call on him. 
The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse number 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's the final requirement, is that you have to call on Jesus Christ as your Savior. To the Christian, this is victorious because we understand that the power of death, the sting of death is over because we've called on Jesus Christ. We've placed our faith in the creator of the universe and his son who came to earth, lived a perfect life, was crucified on a cross, was buried and in a tomb for three days. And three days later on that Sunday morning, some 2,000 years ago, he rose out of the grave purchasing, finalizing our salvation. He died for us and he died for you. Some would say, well, I'm not going to believe the resurrection. I'm good. Folks, the reality is this. If Christ is not risen, the dead, dreadful consequence is not that death ends life. As Stuart Kennedy said, the dreadful consequence is not that death ends life. The dreadful consequence is that you are still in your sin. If Christ didn't rise, somebody say, I just won't believe that and, and, and I'll be good. No, no, no. If Christ is not risen, the dreadful consequence is not that death just ends life. The dreadful consequence is that we are still in our sin. But he did rise from the grave and he rose to save you. And if you will... Accept him as your savior today. He promises to give you eternal life. If you understand that you're a sinner and that you've never repented, and that word repent just means to agree with God that you've sinned against him. And you've never repented of your sin. If you're here today, our prayer is that right now in your home, if a group of friends are there with you, pray with them you're by yourself pray by yourself but that you would bow your heart to God ask him to forgive you of your sin confess the death burial and resurrection of Christ and receive him alone as your savior you say oh, pastor I don't have all the perfect words friends there's no magic words that save us the only thing that saves us is the heart for with the heart Man believes unto righteousness. And our prayer is today that you will receive Christ. Right now, stop and pray and ask Christ to come into your heart and to save you. We say, well, what do I pray? You pray a prayer of confession. Lord, I confess I have sinned against you. You have a, ask a prayer of forgiveness. God, please forgive me of my sin and a prayer of acceptance, and please come into my heart and save me. And then a prayer of acknowledgement. I know that you're the Savior. I know that you died for my sins. I know that you were buried. And I know that three days later you rose again, giving us the victory of eternal life. And then a prayer of thanksgiving. I thank you for saving me. So our desire, our hope, our work, our effort, all week long has been so that you could hear the gospel and have an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And that's our prayer for you today. If you're a believer, we live in a crazy time. Can I tell you, we need not be fearful or frightened because our future is settled when we put faith in Christ alone. And I pray this morning that you will put not only your saving faith in Christ, but your daily faith in Christ, letting him have the rule and control and reign in your life. Father, thank you for the time in the word. I pray for everyone that hears this video that is watching that today many, many, many folks would be saved. Many folks would turn their life over to you. Many folks will give their heart and life to Christ. Help us this morning, Lord, to be open and honest with you. 
You're a great God and a great Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for checking us out this morning on CanyonRidgeBaptist.tv, our Facebook, YouTube pages. And I'm so thankful that you listened. If you still have questions about eternal life, again, let me repeat that salvation is recognizing that we've sinned against God, repenting of that, apologizing for that, for lack of a better term, uh, understanding that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and God the Son, as we like to say, and that He died, He was buried, and three days after His burial, He rose again from the, the grave under His own power totally unique to Christianity, and lives today at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. If you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior today, we are pumped. We are so excited for you. What a great thing that is. And what we would ask you to do is to do us this favor, if you will. Would you go to the contact page at the bottom of CanyonRidgeBaptist.tv, fill that out, let us know in the notes section that you accepted Christ as your Savior. And we want to get some material into your hands. If you'll give us your address, we'll uh, mail it to you. If you give us your email, we'll connect with you via email or however you prefer but we really want to get some stuff in your hands to help you in your journey and in your walk with Christ. The greatest step you ever made was the the step of salvation and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now is a journey of joy as we strive to live live for Christ in accordance with His Word. And I pray, our prayer is, that you will reach out to us and let us know I promise you we won't share your information with anybody. Not a single person will ever know about it outside of the administrative staff at Canyon Ridge Baptist Church. And we will try to be a huge help and a blessing to you in your life. If you have a prayer request, you can email any of your prayer requests to prayer at canyonridgebaptist.com. You can reach us through a Facebook messenger. You can call us at our office at 858-627-9394. And again, folks, our prayer is to be a help and a blessing and an encouragement to you as you walk with Christ. If you're a Christian who's struggling, again, you can reach us prayer at CanyonRidgeBaptist.com. You can Facebook message us. You can call our office. We would love to help you in any way that we possibly can. And if you're in the San Diego area, would you please do us a favor? Would you come by when the coronavirus is over? Would you come by Canyon Ridge and let us get to know you and meet you? We would love to be a help and a blessing to you in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless all of you and happy Easter. Thanks so much for joining us today. Every Sunday at 8.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m., and 5 p.m., we have services right here, CanyonRidgeBaptist.tv. Why don't you take a moment and send that link to five people, CanyonRidgeBaptist.tv. Also, every week after the 10.30 service, there's a live chat with Pastor Chadwick. We hope that you'll join us for that. We have a lot of fun, and it's great to be able to connect in yet another way. On Wednesdays at 7 p.m., we have community Bible study by Zoom. Just go to CanyonRidgeBaptist.tv and click on the link for your age group. You'll have a great time, be able to talk with folks, actually interact with them uh, via that video conferencing software. Every Friday, we have an activity for kids. 10.30 a.m. is Bible Quiz for Kids. Parents want to encourage you to have your kids there for that. They'll learn about the Word of God. They'll have a great time. And most importantly, they'll use up some of that pent-up energy. Thanks again for joining us today. God bless.